The early 19th century saw mill towns take hold along the banks of South Central Ontario's Grand and Speed Rivers. The Industrial Revolution witnessed three of these places in particular blossom into little Manchesters. How these once rival communities adapted to the information age, joining forces to become the modern day city of Cambridge is the subject of our story. It is a story of industrial evolution in a locale that prides itself on the manufacture of just about everything, including the kitchen sink. The Grand River. Rising in the Georgian Bay Highlands, Tinta Atua, as it was known to the First Peoples, has hosted civilization for 2,000 years. An annual event held here, staged along the river, is steeped in totemism. Riverfest is a celebration of inheritance, a tribute to the natural resource that nurtured the development of three once separate communities, Galt, Preston, and Hespeler which, taking in other small hamlets, amalgamated in 1973 to become the city of Cambridge. Upstream, at the junction of the Speed and Grand Rivers, today it's business as usual. A cornerstone of early enterprise, milling, has been sustained non-stop since Mennonite Joseph Erb first laid the foundation in 1807. Head miller Ken Marler supervises the production of bakers and household flour, 215 tons a day. What began as Cambridge Mills became Preston, the first and largest inland settlement of the province. John Clare. Preston and uh, Hasler were settled by German settlers. Galt was settled by Scottish settlers, and uh, all of them seemed to see the um, resource in the water power that would be available. And so a number of dams were built in the early days, and uh, factories grew up on the rivers. Galt is primarily a textile town, and later became a heavy manufacturing town as well. Uh, Preston started out as a manufacturing town, and Hesper had a, had a mixture of both. In Preston, uh, uh, Jacob Beck, the father of Sir Adam Beck, started a foundry making plows and stoves and sugar kettles. Uh, and a number of other foundries started over time. Still productive today, the Clare Brothers was one of Preston's original foundries to capitalize on Adam Beck's scheme of harnessing Niagara to electrify Ontario. Heating and air conditioning appliances replace earlier cast iron products. By 1845, the issue of water power would lead to a shift of allegiance by one entrepreneur. I always grew up under the impression that the herbs had been the great founders of Preston, and indeed they did found the town, but they weren't people who really got things going. Because in fact, they wanted to retain their own rights um, and, and monopoly. A man came along named William Hespler, intending to build a, a flour mill, and the, the herbs certainly knew this. And he bought 100 acres from them along the river. They allowed him to work for well over a year constructing a dike parallel to the river, which would form a mill race. And he was about to start work on his mill and dam across the river when the herbs came along and announced that, yes, he had bought the land, but certainly not the water rights, 
and he had to cease and desist. Well, Jacob Hessler moved on to the next town, New Hope, which had originally been Bergy Town, and it was shortly thereafter named for him, and he ran virtually every industry in the town. He got a flour mill going and, and a grist mill and a, a textile mill, and Hessler's very strong industrial base came from the years when he was the prominent citizen of the town. At the original site of the Stamped and Enameled Ware Company, active in Hespeler in the 1800s, American Standard carries on business today. Bathtubs and sinks take over where enameled kitchenware left off. Hespeler. It's a name stamped on goods from furniture to woolens to hockey sticks. Like its neighbors, this once autonomous community had its fortunes tied to the whims of international trade. The impetus for its industrial economy, Cambridge's natural heritage is also irrevocably tied to man-made landmarks. Their preservation is the focus of Valerie Springs' work. Looking at the architecture, which I think is the best chronology of, of a, a history, the, the heritage of a, of a community, I think really speaks clearly through their architecture. You see a number of masons who work in, in all three communities. You see people mostly from Germanic background coming into Preston and Hespler, and predominantly Scottish coming into Galt, which is why I think that Galt was referred to as the Granite City, um, because there was such a, a predominance of um, natural stone to build with, and you have talented Scottish masons who come in and using that building material construct a lot of the architecture that we're surrounded by today. You start off with very simple architecture, the, the workman's cottage. The earliest one is about 1837, and it's just south of us on the riverbank. And um, it's simply laid out, and yet its charm is still with us today. And then you start seeing the architecture becoming much more elaborate. Um, even within a short span of, of 50 years, you come from the, the worker's cottage to what we have behind us in Central Presbyterian Church, which was built in 1880 and is a wonderful example of high Victorian Gothic style of architecture. The river that was Cambridge's economic mainstay also shaped social development. There are a number of operations that, while adapting to the dynamics of 20th century manufacturing, remain an integral part of the community's inner core. Blending past and present, this is one example of a company entrenched in Cambridge life. James Warnock. The textile industry uh, got its start here um, because there was there were so many other um, uh, advantages to this community. Um, water power played a big part of it, as well as Southern Ontario at the time was becoming a good marketplace for exactly what they were making here. In 1881, Adam Warnock which is my great-great-grandfather, started the Galt Knitting Company with a group called The Syndicate. And then through successive generations, of which I'm the fifth, uh, we've run at the Galt Knitting Company. And then um, in 1954, my father, James A., uh, more or less restarted the company and uh, as Tiger Brand and uh, we've maintained both the Galt Knitting Company and Tiger Brand since then as a textile company. Like the wheels of mechanization marking time for a century and a half, is the former town of Galt's timepiece in the old city hall. 
Motivated by its early entrepreneurs, this latter of the three communities to develop quickly rose to prominence. Archivist Jim Quantrell. William Dixon, who was the, the founder of Galt, arrived with his uh, agent Epsilon Shade in around 1816, uh, looking for basically for a town site. The, the first buildings tended to be along, along Mill Creek, and that's where the factories uh, tended to be built, and the town tended to, de to develop organically along the, the east bank of the river. Galt developed uh, quite, quite uh, rapidly after about 1830, in between 1830s and 1870s, and it tended to become, or it did become, in fact, the, uh, the largest uh, town in this area. Preston really wasn't too far behind. I guess in about the 1850s, uh, Galt had a population of about 22, 2300, uh, and Preston had about uh, 1200, and uh, Berlin at the time, which was later Kitchener, had even less than that. So the two of them between the two towns uh, tended to be the strongest economically, and they even at that time tended to look at each other, uh, look at each other as as, uh, as rivals. Here's one inspiration for the modern computer, the Jacquard loom, still in use today. It was born in the Industrial Revolution. Come the 1900s, manufacturing rose to a peak, and competition, paradoxically became the driving force that would ultimately unite the three separate river economies of Waterloo County. Throughout contemporary life, values and institutions play a vital role within a community, linking it with its past. Market Day provides an important social-cultural tie for the people of Cambridge. Here, Conventional and new urban and rural values have convened for several generations. Tracing the growth of each of the three communities highlights characteristics that have influenced the place of today. Certainly into the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, it would seem to have been rather an oppressive life. People worked 10-hour days. They ran by the clock. Uh, they worked Saturday morning always. Naturally, wages were very low, as one would guess. People seemed to go home and work in their garden because they had to produce some of their own food, just uh, for a cost reason. And yet, the uh, life in the town seems to be very rich with activity and interest. There was a debating society in Preston, which attracted crowds of people to watch the debates. There were different little theater groups. In Preston, the Germans had every four years a festival called the Kermis. It was a carnival. It's hard to describe, but the, the people wore elaborate costumes. Uh, booths were set up in the arena, and they, they would um, have typical fare from different countries. In the German booth, you'd have, have typical German cookies and treats, and there'd be English candies in the English booth, and the Irish booth would have different things. Athletics, of course, always played a very important part. Then there was a fierce rivalry between the towns. Built on similarities, this rivalry would, ironically, lead to the forging of ties. Competition among companies to attract workers, played like a sport in itself, sparked the need for getting to and fro in a more efficient fashion. In the late 1880s, several businessmen uh, in the area decided that they should have a railroad of some kind, and the original plan was for a horse-drawn coach on tracks running from Galt to Preston. Uh, the Clares in Preston were very interested in this, and Martin Todd in Galt, and eventually Mr. Forbes, who ran the mill in Hesper, became interested. The big stumbling block was the town council in Preston, who refused for many years to grant a right-of-way down the center of the main street to the railway, and the railway felt it was imperative to have the right-of-way. Finally, in the early 1890s, the right-of-way was granted, and in 1895, the line opened from Galt to Preston, and the next year it was continued to Hasper. In the following years, it was connected with a street railway in Berlin, now Kitchener, and joined to the Lake Erie, Rail Lake Erie and Northern Railway, which ran from Galt to Port Dover, and so you could take the train that distance. And, uh, it was much easier to ship manufactured goods outside. Another factor which opened the communities up to the outside world, Preston in particular, was mineral springs. 
I believe the eight, it was 1847 when one of the Herb family was drilling for salt and he found what he thought was quite useless and that was stinky water, which was sulfur water. By the 1880s, though, people were thinking that this water might have curative powers and the hotel trade started to flourish. Many people came from Toronto for the cure and from the U.S. In fact, there's a story told of a Preston businessman who was very badly bothered by, by rheumatism, and he went to Germany, to Baden, to take the cure. And they sent him on to Bad Neuheim to take the cure. And there they told him there was nothing they could do for him, but they thought if he went back to North America, there was a tiny town they'd heard of which had marvelous mineral springs, Preston, and of course, this man was from Preston. Out of the storied past come remnants from the era of Hespover's once king of the textile business, Dominion Woolens and Worsted's company. I think the most fascinating period from my perspective for Hespler is the, the Second World War years. Um, they lost a number of their male workers to the, the war effort and were forced to recruit women from uh, Newfoundland and, and northern Ontario. Um, over a 10-year period, they recruited over uh, 6,000 women, bringing them into this rather small, small town. And that influence of, of young women certainly, I think, changed the social demographics of, of that community. Certainly the dances attracted a, a lot of attention because they were held uh, Friday and Saturday night. And um, men from all over the region would come to Haspler to participate in these dances because of the number of, of young women that were there. Here are found family names, linked to original factory workforces, to the boom in the Industrial Revolution, and to the war years. All are rooted in Cambridge's makeup, the human dimension of an industrial legacy. I don't know that there's so much that's different about the three communities when you come right down to it. Uh, they, were, uh, they were all industrial towns. They all had the same sort of outlook as far as the, the local economy goes. They were both interested in ensuring that uh, their, their towns were prosperous, that their, their people had uh, good jobs and good income, that their towns were nice places to live in. Uh, their, if you go back far enough, their origins were all different. So uh, from that point of view, I think the, the, there might be minor differences uh, in, the, in the towns, but. Basically, they all had the same outlook, and they're, they're basically the same, same type of town, same, same type of hardworking individuals. From water power to steam to robotics, the evolution of industry has played a dominant role in the life of this community. Industry as an institution is woven into its culture. The need to adapt in a more rapidly changing society is greater than in Joseph Herb's day, yet some things come full circle. We have uh, several customers who were purchasing product in the Orient, are now coming back to North American-based sourcing because we are what they want. Uh, timely delivery, uh, fashion conscious, quality, and now the, the newest aspect of our business that's playing a very large part in uh, selling newer retailers is our ecological standards are much higher than that of uh, the competition in the third world. We're here because the river was here when, when our ancestors were here. We don't draw an ounce of water from the river any longer or put anything into the river for that matter. Our products are manufactured with the environment in mind from start to finish. Tinta Ottawa, River Erse, Grand Riviere, now simply the Grand, running its 300 kilometer course down to Lake Erie. For two millennia, the waterway and human destiny irrevocably tied. A unifying force, today it binds three separate chapters in a saga of Canadian enterprise. The towns amalgamated quite well. I think the only people that uh, think of them today as three separate towns are those who were old enough to really remember the amalgamation well. I suppose until I die, I will think of myself as living in Preston. 
However, it was a very sensible decision to join up, uh, to rationalize the fire system, um, to regionalize the police force. These things were very sensible and, uh, and at the time had come. One clings to, to the past and, and the nice thing that we had our own little town, but we still have that feeling if we want. Many people who move into the community are much more interested than natives. Heritage Cambridge has been instrumental in, in spreading awareness and publishing booklets about the community. And so I don't think the history will be lost. It wasn't until I started to travel to places like England and the United States and, and even other areas in, in Canada that I realized how truly unique Cambridge was in terms of its abundance of stone buildings and its variety of architecture. And I, I really developed an appreciation, particularly in the last few years in, in my job. Um, as I say, you take for granted what you've grown up with. You expect them to be there for the rest of your lives. And when you realize that, uh, that they're not always going to be here, that they are under constant threat of demolition or development, um, you realize how important it is to work to preserve those buildings. Those who stake their dream on the banks of the Speed and Grand Rivers pursue a vision, a vision not so much represented by the balance sheet, but the human effort and the achievement to underwrite it. The future of Cambridge, as the future of the country, will be predicated on our ability to dream, as did the early pioneers. For in our midst, as perennial as the river itself, is our inheritance to be passed on to future generations.